the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And I welcome you this morning to worship at or with First Presbyterian Church. Uh, we are grateful. This is the Lord's Day, and he invites us to come into his presence and to worship our Lord together. So glad, however you are coming in, that you can spend these, the, the, these moments with us on this Sunday morning in the worship of God. Uh, a few announcements as we begin our worship service today. Uh, there are uh, some that are printed. Uh, last week we were celebrating uh, the birth of Elliot Wesley Bullock, and this week we are celebrating the birth of Lydia Kathleen Eikenberry, and I'm so happy about that. I've got a, a lovely new granddaughter, and Glenn and Sarah are doing well. I had a chance to see Lydia yesterday, and it's a great blessing. We give thanks to the Lord for that. We're celebrating that today. Uh, a few other things to note uh, announcement-wise. Uh, today, we will be celebrating communion as we typically do on the first Sunday of the month. And what we'll do, I'll, I'll, I'll close out the, the service here, and then um, we will bring communion to those of you who are in the sanctuary. Uh, just remain seated at the end of the service if you want to take communion, and we will bring communion to you. In, in your pews. And for those of you who would like to drive in, um, you can drive into the, uh, to the church parking lot in the front of the building, in front of the CE entrance, come in from the east on the library side, Martin Luther King, and uh, you can uh, uh, pull your car over to the side there, and we will bring communion to you there and pray with you there. We've got some individual uh, communion uh, elements to uh, the prepackage to uh, to share with all of you. So that's how we will do communion today um, here in the sanctuary after the service is, is uh, concluded and in the parking lot for those who would like to drive in. The other announcement I would like uh, to make, uh, um, of course, Tuesday is an important day in the life of our nation. It's election day and uh, we are inviting people um, and maybe some other churches or other people might come join us. A time of prayer outside our church here, out in our uh, little um, uh, grassy area and sidewalk area out in front of the church at 11 o'clock on Tuesday for those who would like to come and pray for our nation. Uh, we'll just try to bathe that election and our country in prayer at this, uh, at this important time, that God would send his blessing upon his people. And you are invited to be with us too. Uh, you can come and go. You don't have to stay the whole time or bring a, a, a lawn chair if you want to do that, but that will be outside. I haven't heard what the weather's going to be like, but we're going to be there. I've seen a thumbs up here. Uh, Sean assures us the weather will be just splendid. So that, that's good. Okay, our call to worship is from Psalm 73. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge to which I may continually come. You have given the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Let us worship God, our rock and our fortress, together, using the affirmation of faith and the prayer of confession that you will find printed in the bulletin. Let every tongue confess, Jesus, Jesus Christ is Lord. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us draw before our holy God, draw near to our holy God, and to admit our need for his forgiveness. Please join me in the prayer of confession printed in the bulletin. Heavenly Father, you have called us out of the world and made us your own through the saving work of Jesus. We admit that the ways of the world are still in us and we continue to sin against you. We allow our fears to take hold of us instead of trusting you. We have looked for the worst in others while excusing our own failings. We strive more for our comfort and our security than for the glory of your name. Forgive us, Lord of grace. Take away the stain and the guilt of our sin and fill us with the joy of knowing we are free and forgiven through the blood of Jesus our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let, a keep a, let us keep a moment of silence and offer to God our individual prayers of confession. Let us pray. we have this promise from Scripture. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Brothers and sisters, believe the good news of the gospel. Through faith in Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. You'll find the words to uh, a great hymn for all our saints printed in the bulletin. Uh, for those of you who are in the sanctuary and have a hymnal, there are hymnals in the back if you want to pick one up. Hymn number 751. Beth, if you will lead us, please. Mm -hmm.
may be seated. Uh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our Psalter reading for today is from Psalm 34. Hear the word of God. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to say a thank you to the bells who have been coming in from time to time and recording things so that we can hear them. It's uh, great to hear the bells. Thank you, Kim, for putting the video together for us. I'm grateful for uh, Audrey also, who is in and leading us in worship this morning in another great song. And I invite you to find the uh, words printed in your bulletin, and we will sing together, Holy Spirit, living breath of God. Let us worship God. Will you please share our New Testament reading for us? Our New Testament reading this morning is from 2 Peter chapter 2, 
verses 1 through 10a. Hear the word of the Lord. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemy. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the righteous under punishment until day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. This is the world word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. On mute. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Um, I'd like to invite the kids now, if we, whatever the case may be, to Genesis chapter 19. We have a typo in the bulletin. It says Genesis 9, but uh, we're, we are in Genesis 19. Genesis 19 this morning. And I will pray in just a moment uh, for the reading of the word. I, I just just to say a few things here at the beginning. The book of Genesis is really a mind-blowing book. Uh, the first book of the Bible is so important, so important for our understanding of who we are and who God is. It is crucial for forming our view of the world. And we are going to be looking this morning at the story of Abraham. We've been following this story for some time. And the story of Abraham gives us uh, an important picture into human nature. And we see it's not always a very pretty picture. There are moments of glory and honor and virtue. And there are also moments of shocking sinfulness. And that's the story of human beings. That's the story of Abraham. And it is important for us to see how God deals with this, how God does, deals with the people who have made, who can sometimes follow him and sometimes not. We come this morning to Genesis 19, and it is one of those shocking examples of sinfulness and we see what God does about it here. Sometimes the book of Genesis is so real and frankly gritty that we wonder if it should come with a parental advisory. Um, and we're in one of those uh, chapters today because God does not sugarcoat the effects of sin or the fall. We see it on, our, in display, on display in our chapter in the story today. So let's pray, and then we will uh, read this chapter together. Oh, Lord our God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is 
true and reliable and infallible and able to help us grow in righteousness. And Lord, we pray that you would speak to us now, that you would send your Holy Spirit, as we sang a moment ago, that you would send your Holy Spirit to enable us to hear and to receive your word and to respond to it in faith. And so, Lord, set aside other distractions and give us an ability, Lord, by your grace to, to turn our attention to you and to hear your voice speaking into our hearts and into our souls. And do so, Lord, and help us to respond in such a way that your name is glorified now and always. For it is in Jesus we pray. Amen. Okay, so our text for this morning is Genesis chapter 19, whole chapter beginning in verse 1. And as you remember what happened before, God sent, um, the, the Lord came to visit Abraham with two other angels to, to tell them about the coming of a son, Isaac, who would be the heir of the promise. And uh, Abraham was interceding for Sodom with the Lord while the two angels went on away. Now these two angels that had met with Abraham are moving on and they've come into Sodom. Uh, Genesis 19, the two angels came to Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth and said, my lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. They said, no, we will spend the night in the town square. But he pressed them strongly. So they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house. And they called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. Lot went out to the men at the entrance, shut the door after him, and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not yet known any man. Bring me, let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, Stand back. And they said, this fellow came to sojourn, and he has become the judge. Now we will do deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man lot and drew near to break the door down. But the men reached out their hands and brought lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great, so that they wore themselves out, groping for the door. Then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here? Sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city, bring them out to, this, to the place. For we bring them out of the place, for we are about to destroy this place. Because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, Up, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But he seemed to his sons-in-law to be jesting. As morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he lingered. So the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. And as they brought them out, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the hills, lest you be swept away. And Lot said to them, Oh, no, my lords, behold, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have shown me great kindness in saving my life. But I cannot escape to the hills, lest the disaster overtake me and I die. 
Behold, this city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my life will be saved. He said to him, Behold, I grant you this favor also, that I will not overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Escape there quickly, for I can do nothing till you arrive there. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun had risen on the earth, and Lot came to Zoar. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife behind him looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord, and he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley, and he looked, and behold, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. So it was that when God destroyed the cities of the valley, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had lived. Now Lot went up out of Zoar and lived in the hills with his two daughters, for he was afraid to live in Zoar. So he lived in a cave with his two daughters. And the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man on earth to come in with us after the manner of all the earth. Come then, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve offspring from our father. So they made their father drink wine that night. And the firstborn went in and lay with her father. He did not know when she lay down or when she arose. The next day the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I lay last night with my father. Let us make him drink wine tonight also that you go in. Then you go in and lie with him that we may preserve offspring from our father. So they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Thus both the daughters of Lot became pregnant by their father. The firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. The younger also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami. He is the father of the Amorites to this day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And we do give thanks to the Lord for his word. This is a hard word. This is a strange word. Uh, and I am going to, uh, to share uh, what I think this chapter is, is teaching us. And I'm going to try to do it briefly. We have a communion Sunday. You know, on Wednesdays, we have an opportunity to go deeper into these passages. And I'm sure there are going to be many questions that I cannot answer in full this morning. Um, and I do invite you to join with us uh, for Bible study on Wednesday at 7 online. And we will uh, look through this passage more. But this is an important passage. And it describes the sinfulness of Sodom and Gomorrah. It also relates the, the strange and twisted actions of these two daughters. But mostly, this chapter is about Lot. It's about Lot. Abraham appears barely at all. But as I work through this passage uh, fairly briefly with you this morning, I want you to see just three things. I want you to see how God rightly judges sin and how we are easily entangled in sin and also that God powerfully rescues us from sin. That's the outline I will use as I work through this chapter with you. God rightly judges sin. We are easily caught up in it, but God rescues us. It is right for God to judge sin. He is holy. And he looks down and he sees the consequences of the fall, uh, the rebellion beginning with Adam and Eve and, and going down now throughout human beings. The people have rebelled against him. And, and God has already resolved once to bring judgment in the flood. 
And now we see another cataclysmic event in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember how when Abraham and Lot, they came into this land of promise and, and their flocks grew and they, they became too big and too, uh, too plentiful for the region where they were dwelling. So Abraham said, let's divide up. You choose first, Lot. You choose where you want to go and I'll take the other half. And, and Lot divided and he went over to the, the Jordan River Valley in the area uh, near the, the, uh, the Dead Sea. And that's where Sodom and Gomorrah were. It was a, a rich and fertile land, a, a good choice from that standpoint. Um, but Sodom was well known then as a place of sin. Genesis 13, 13. 13, now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. But Lot chose to live not only around them, but eventually we will see he moves into Sodom and takes a house in Sodom and makes his dwelling among these people. In the last chapter, last week, we saw how God told Abraham that he would judge Sodom. And Abraham interceded, and God said that he would spare Sodom if only ten righteous people could be found there. But God knew, and we see, that there are not even ten righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah. In fact, I would say that there's probably about three and a half I'll let you judge my math as we go through the story. Uh, Sodom becomes an example of all the fallen humanity and worldly wickedness. And these two vis visitors, these angels, come into town and they are in Lot's house and every last man, we are told, from the young to the old, every last man comes and surrounds the house in a show of intimidation and demands to have these visitors come out to them so that they may use them sexually. That's what's going on here. And they would not turn aside from their aims, not for any reason, not for any warning. Even uh, the sons-in-law, when Lot tries to warn them, they think he's just joking. Even when the angels strike with blindness all of the, the men of the city, they are still, they are groping around, but they are groping for the door, Lot's door. At sunrise, God destroys the cities in a rain of sulfur and fire. And Lot narrowly escapes with his daughters and his wife until she looks back. She's the half. She's half saved from the destruction. And the daughters, what is this about? The daughters concoct this strange plant. They plan they are so isolated, you know, Lot negotiated, uh, let, me, let me go, I, I don't want to be in the hills uh, on my own. I, I just could be this little tiny city of Zoar, because I can't, I just, I'm not very good at living in the wilderness. So he goes into Zonar, Zoar, but he's afraid even to, to be there. He's afraid of any kind of social contact in the valley right now. He's just a hermit. And the daughters are afraid, what's going to happen to us? What will happen to us? So they concoct this plan and they get their father drunk and sleep with him. Both of them become pregnant. One would be the father of Moab, the other the father of the Ammonites, both nations that would remain bitter enemies of the children of Abraham for generations to come. Well, we look at this, we, we just glance at the story and we see uh, a dramatic picture of how Sodom and Gomorrah have become a lasting parable of sinfulness. And Jesus himself uses them as an illustration and as a warning. 
I'll share uh, from that passage, uh, one of the passages later. But we see that God, God sees the sin, and God, our holy and righteous judge, rightly judges sin. And we can be easily entangled in sin. Lot is entangled in the sin around him. Now, Lot is described as a righteous man. Don't miss this. Lot is described as a righteous man, but that does not mean that he is perfect. I mentioned this later before, that righteousness especially had to do with loyalty to God and his covenant. It was not any kind of a, of a statement that this person never sins. We've all sinned. We've already seen how Abraham is capable of great uh, uh, faithfulness at one moment and then fear and faithlessness in another. But he is a righteous man, and Lot is described as righteous. In fact, in this in this uh, passage that that Peggy read for us from Second Peter, he's described this way three times. <coughs> Excuse me. God rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked. For as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. So Lot is a righteous man. He is loyal to God, but he is also caught up in his world and in the sins of this world. But he is righteous. He knows. He knows, doesn't he? Don't you get the impression from the story that, that Lot knows what's going to happen? As soon as these visitors come into town, he's inviting them into the other house. And he says, no, they say, no, we're just going to stay here in the square. And he persuades them strenuously. He know, you can't do that. Let me take you home. And then I will get you out of town before daybreak. That's the implication here. I, I, I think that's the reason to, I can't get into too many details, but like the unleavened bread, it's kind of like the here's your hat, watch your hurry thing. Uh, we're, I'm going to keep you safe overnight, and then we'll get you out of town. And he does. He does plead with his sons-in-law uh, that they would flee the destruction. He goes to them. Uh, they are described as sons-in-law. This is just another little detail. They're, they're not married yet. They're just engaged. But engagement was a, a really big deal in the ancient world. And, and they are regarded as sons-in-law. And, 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 and Noah tries to save them. He does his best to warn others and to fend off the mob. He knows what is right and knows what is wrong. But, but Lot, of, Lot is also flawed, isn't he? He chose to live there, and, and it's rubbing off on him. He's willing for his daughters to marry these, these dubious townsmen. And the, the account here is, is quite uh, explicit about how every man of the city was outside of Lot's house. I take that to mean the future sons-in-law as well. So Lot then does this really just shocking thing of his willingness to give up his own daughters to the mob. How can we account for that? And then when the destruction is imminent, Lot himself finds it hard to leave. He lingers. He can't quite bring himself to leave behind the status of the gate. He was sitting at the gate. That probably means he was something of, a, of an alderman of the city. He had the comforts of the city, the comforts of his own home. And when push came to shove, he dug in his heels a little bit. The sin, sin is clinging to him. 
And sin, sin clings to us, and we cling to it. We love our comforts. We love our things, too. We love our phones. We love our reputations. We try to keep our sins hidden from the eyes of others. We work hard at, at gaining the approval of those around us, of pleasing other people. We like money. We like the things it can buy. We, too, are torn between devotion to God and to the world to the things of this world. John warns of this in 1 John. And, and remember, John here says, do not love the world. Uh, and there's times when John speaks about the world meaning just everything that is, as in God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But there are other times when John speaks about the world and it's clear from the context, he doesn't mean everything that God has created. He means the world that has set itself up in rebellion against God. That's the sense of the world here that he's using it when he says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world... The desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Lot is torn. And we are sometimes torn. We love God, but we love the things of this world too. And even as the people in Sodom and even Lot's son-in-laws could not hear the warning, so it can be hard for us to hear the warnings. We're comfortable. But God judges sin, and we are enmeshed in it. But the last thing we see is that God powerfully rescues us from sin. God powerfully, even forcefully, rescues us from sin. What did God do when Lot hesitated? In Genesis 19, verse 15, what did God do? As morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he lingered. So the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. So the Lord in his mercy, these angels, because of the mercy of the Lord, they seized Lot and his wife and his two daughters and pulled them out of the city. They escape. Lot's wife looks back, so she does not escape to the hills. And the three escape the fire and brimstone, but the family is still plagued by sin, not just from Sodom and Gomorrah, but the sin within. Don't we see how, how it's never enough to be delivered simply from circumstances around us? We need deliverance inside as well. Our nature must be changed. We have trials and tribulations, and we ask for God's help to change the hard circumstances in our lives and in His mercy. He often pulls us by the hand and delivers us. But we also need help within with to, to find cleansing and forgiveness before Jesus comes again and we all face the judgment throne. And Jesus can do that very thing. He can bring cleansing and forgiveness to us as we repent and believe and follow him. But we are sometimes tempted to turn back. We are on a path following Jesus, but sometimes we look back longingly at the days where we didn't have to follow anybody except our own desires.
Jesus commented on Genesis chapter 19. And Jesus said this in Luke 17. beginning in verse 28. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed, when Jesus returns and the final judgment comes. On that day, Jesus says, let the one who is on the house top with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. We need to lose our lives in the sense of losing our self-determination, our self-governing, and turn our lives over to the leading, the governing of Jesus who loves us. We need to be rescued from external dangers in this life too. We long for social prosperity and opportunities for everybody and good health care. We are so eager to be done with this pandemic. And it will pass. But even then, we'll still have trials, right? Our nation is tense leading up to this election. It's a, it's a wonderful thing, this uh, uh, democratic republic, that we are able to elect leaders. Um, but it gets tense, and in one sense, it's, it's kind of hard to imagine that we put ourselves through this every four years. There's a lot at stake. There's a lot at stake. We should all vote. We should vote prayerfully. We should vote our Christian convictions. We also seek a deliverance that goes beyond any political victory that we can imagine. And do you know... We are destined for eternity, and in eternity, I think, we will scarce remember these moments. These are dark times, but they will not last. We are destined for God's everlasting kingdom. And it is so important for us now to see the eternal light of Christ who loves us and who is merciful and who takes us by the hand and delivers us. We have a Redeemer who is able to save us body and soul forever. He has, in the, in the words of Colossians 1, He has delivered us. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Lot is righteous and sinful at the same time, but he's rescued. He's rescued, uh, Genesis 9 tells me, that God looked with favor on Abraham and delivered Lot. And we too, like Lot, we are righteous but also sinful. We follow Jesus, but the ways of the world still cling to us. And we are redeemed, we are declared righteous, because God looks with favor upon the Son, Jesus, and rescues us. So God remembered Abraham and saved Lot. God remembers Christ and his cross and saves us. And we remember too. We remember when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. We remember when Jesus says, this is my body given for you. This is my blood that is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when we remember, we look again and again to Jesus. And I close just by quoting the words of the hymn. We sang for all the saints. 
And over the years, this, this, this hymn has become precious to me. And I think of it speaking to our days, even our days right now. And when the strife is fierce, the warfare long, like now, steal on the ear the distant triumph song. We, we just can barely make out with our ears the sounds of victory singing. And we know that's where we're headed. And when we hear that, then hearts are brave again and arms are strong. Alleluia. And then there breaks a yet more glorious day. The saints triumphant rise up and bright away. And this is my favorite line of all. We will see this one day. The King of glory passes on his way. And we will see it. You and I will see it. But we hear it. We hear the song now. We know that day is coming. And so for today, we will hear his warnings. We will be glad when he takes us by the hand and delivers us. And we will see the King of glory. Let us pray. Our Lord Jesus, we thank you for the mercy and the love that you have shown for us. That with the Father and the Spirit, you determined to come down and to give yourself as a sacrifice for us on the cross. Well, Lord our God, we pray that you would enable us to follow you, enable our hearts to be brave again and our arms to be strong to follow you today, because today feels like a dark day. We are distressed by evil around us. We are distressed by hardships and pandemics. And we are distressed even, Lord, to see the sinfulness that still clings to our own hearts. And Lord, we're shocked to see the sins described in Genesis in the Bible, but even dismayed to see how we too can betray you and disobey you and ignore you. But Father, you are steadfast in your love. You are faithful to your, conf uh, your, your covenant. You love us with an everlasting love. You in mercy have sent Jesus, our Redeemer, to us. And so we pray, God of mercy, that you would fill us with your mercy now. Be with our nation in this time of election. Lead us in a way of righteousness and peace and prosperity. We long for leaders we long for leaders with character. We long for leaders with good and godly policies. We are grateful for our republic and for an opportunity to vote. Help us to make wise choices. And remind us, Lord, when the polls close and when the decisions are made, whenever that may be, that you reign still. And Lord, in this pandemic, be with those who are sick and be with those who are quarantining and fearful. Be with those who are helping the sick and those working on vaccines. Lord, be gracious to our economy to preserve livelihoods and keep us protected. Lord, thank you for being with Waukegan this past week in the midst of uh, protests following a, a police shooting. Uh, the process of, of seeking justice is going forward and, has, and people have spoken their peace and uttered their prayers in, in peace. And Lord, we are grateful for that. And Lord our God, we pray that you would be with your people. Lord, we pray for Jeff DeLay and his family quarantining, Corey, who, who is sick with COVID. We pray for those who are uh, 
fleeing dangers and wildfires in California and Colorado. Lord, we pray that you would be with these new babies. We give you thanks and praise. Thanks and praise for Elliot, for baby Elliot. We give you thanks and praise for baby Lydia. And Lord, wrap your arms around them, even as you have wrapped your arms around us and called us as your own. And Father, in these days, when it feels like we are living in, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, and there is darkness around us and within us. Enable us, O Lord, to keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus, the light of the world. And enable us to be salt and light. To bear witness to your eternal kingdom. And Lord our God, thank you for hearing us. Thank you for knowing us so well. Thank you for taking us by the hand. Thank you for interceding for us, Lord Jesus, before the Father's throne. And hear us now, O God, as we pray together as Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In just a moment, uh, I will share communion. Uh, I, the elders will bring communion to those of you seated in your pews. Um, and uh, while we were distributing here to those who are in person, uh, those of you who are Zooming in are welcome to drive in and join us in the parking lot, and we will serve communion to the do you there. Uh, but whether you are coming in or wherever you are going, wherever God has you right now, receive his blessing and his benediction upon you. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.